f inverse derivative. So we have to find the inverse function, right? Technically, inverse does not exist, but the, from the context of the problem at nine, so it's a positive side, isn't it? So we can do things like this, restrict the domain like that. So the inverse exists, you know what I'm saying? Because if I put negative nine in here, then of course you have to go to the other side to find the inverse, you know what I'm saying? So it's like inverse, is it a function? Is it a relation? It doesn't matter in this context. Okay, so F inverse, let's find it. F inverse of X is of course square root X. And then I don't have to hold your hand and guide you through how to find that, right? Assuming you know how to do that much. Then it's easier for now, you don't have to, but write it like that, then find the derivative. And that's one half x to the negative one half power, correct? Say yes. Okay. And then, of course, f inverse of 9. And that's one half, and then you put 9 here, right? Right, like that. Too much algebra? Okay, fine. Is it better? Still too much algebra? Okay, so this is one sixth. And wow, like that's easy. Finally, an easy problem in calculus PC. Yeah, would I ever insert you like this? With this kind of easy, would I ever insert your intelligence like this, right? Like, no, 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 God, no. Why would I do that, right? See, that's not the point that we are trying to make, but I still like to show you something. We can learn a lot from this. F prime of x, of course, is 2x, right? Why did I close that parenthesis? And then f prime of 3 is equal to 6. And then compare these two guys, right? Do you see the relationship? Very striking symmetry there. Is it a great discovery or is it something very, very, very obvious? Okay, I got a question. Here's a 3, 9, right? This is 3, 9. What is the corresponding? This is f. And this is F inverse. Where is the corresponding point? What do I mean by corresponding point of F inverse? Nine three. Would that be nine three? So obviously, I mean, it's like, does anybody need a clarification? What I mean by corresponding point here? Then, what is the slope of F at three nine. Slope right there is six, isn't it? I'm going to write it a little more professionally. F prime of 3 is equal to 6. You know what I'm saying? What is the slope right here then? F inverse prime of 9. And that's of course 1 over 6 according to our calculation now, isn't it? Say yes. Okay. Yes. Now, is it a shocker that these two are reciprocals or is it something very, very obvious? Obvious. It's obvious by looking at the symmetry now, isn't it? Because the inverse switch is X and Y, right? 3, 9, 9, 3. That much you knew. And slope is kind of like delta Y over delta X. So this will be reciprocal as well. You know what I'm saying? If these guys switch, just like graphically symmetry tells you they have to be reciprocals. Because these things reflect around. It's like that line, Y is equal to X. Now, my question is then, what happens if there's a function that we don't know how to find the inverse, which is like this? You guys know how to find the inverse of that function? I sure don't. But we can still find the derivative of that key here. Derivative of that inverse at, in this case, 3. Right, but, 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 big, big, big mistake. I don't want you to see the graph yet. 
big mistake here is, oh yeah, then we let's find g prime of x, which is 3x squared plus 1, and then inverse evaluate it, so g prime of 3, which is equal to 28. So then g inverse prime of 3 will be 1 over 28. It's the most common mistake. No, do you see what's wrong with that logic? This is not this three and this three. They are not just reciprocal. Watch this, right? Inverse of this at nine is reciprocal to inverse of F at three. It has to be the corresponding point, not just like graph of this and graph of right there. They have no relationship whatsoever. X value. You have to switch the X and Y. Know the correct Y value to go with this three. That's our problem. You get it? Ah, so we have to have better systematic way of doing this now than this. Mr. But Ken, we, yes. Is it also missing the prime, the G inverse three? Like G, G prime three? inverse, I think I have it. In yeah. the problem? <laughs> yes, it is. Okay. Oh my God. I was like trying to quickly type this in before this period starts and then of course I missed the prime, okay? Now, well then, how are you going to do this? Right, so, but we gleaned something very important from, let's come back to something we already know how to do. See, in case you ever become a teacher or professor, this is a good teaching technique. If you want to teach a new process, you always go back to the easy enough problem that students already know and that they, they see what it looks like. That way it's easier to teach the process, right? If you want to teach the new process with something completely new, then, then they just get lost. So this is uh, not that you couldn't do it directly like this, but that's not the point. It's the process I want to teach here, okay? So I'm going to erase all of this now. That was nice and swell, but that's not what we are trying to get at. So here is my f. This side is my f of x, f of x, not f prime of x, f of x, and here's f prime of x, f prime of x, f inverse of x. I want to have a now. And then problem says f inverse of 9, right? So we'll pretend that we, our algebra is not good enough to see this picture, okay? We'll also pretend that our algebra is not good enough to find the inverse of this function, because that's usually how these problems present itself. We only thing we know is this. This is 9 comma something. So far so good? Our first thing is we have to find that corresponding point, which is something comma nine. You know what I'm saying? So now let's use algebra f of x, whatever that x value has to give you nine. Is that what that something is? In other words, x squared needs to be nine. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then, of course, x is equal to plus or minus 3, except we are using the right-hand side, right? So this is 3. Are you with me that much? We have to find that correct x and y value corresponding points. That's like our job number one before we do anything else. And then, then we can find this, 2x, right? So if I wanted this over here, f inverse prime of nine, I have to evaluate f inverse, f prime of three here. Do you see this graph? Nine, three, three, nine. Which x value to use? It's not the same thing. That's the key here. And this becomes six. Therefore, this becomes one sixth. Good. Now, here is the uh, generally, I don't really feel good about formula, 
But if you will, this is the formula. F inverse prime of B is equal to F prime of reciprocal, reciprocal of F prime of A. Now, notice that I wrote A and B here and they are not the same thing. Right, but this itself is not all of the formula. I'm gonna push it down. Oh, really? What is wrong with this thing? I guess this video is shot. This comes with a FA is equal to B. That's the point AB, right? And corresponding point is, of course, BA. So those of you who memorize this as a formula will just plug in the same point nine here and then you get the wrong answer. Is it abundantly clear? Are we ready to tackle the next problem then? Because now we cannot quite see the picture, right? Uh, I'll still cheat and show you the picture. Because, uh, well, usually this picture is never given on the test. Okay, so let's do it the correct way. This is our G. G is right here, and this is G inverse right here. Okay? And three. So when G prime is equal to three, it's right here, isn't it? So our point is three, one. Graphically, and later and then, of course, corresponding point, this is equal to minus one, three. This is our first, this will be our first task here. So far with me? So far with me? Okay, so let's start. So here's my g of x, and then here's my g inverse of x. Okay, so far I have this point, three, and some unknown. You with me? Then here I would have that corresponding point, some unknown, and three. Good. Good, 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 good. Which means I have to set this g of x is equal to three, mainly q plus x plus one is equal to three. You, 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 how do we solve this thing? Do you remember forgetting rational zero theorem, p's and q's and synthetic division? Ah, 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 ah. Let's not let's not jump the gun. I mean, it's worst thing comes to worst, but don't you usually try just one first and negative one? Look, 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 look. If I plug in one here, I get three. Ah, one works, right? That's great now, isn't it? So one works. But how do you know there are there aren't two more that also works? Oh, that is a they very better rule of signs. Huh? Oh, rule of sign. That is also great, right? Okay, 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 okay. It's actually easier than that. From the graph, you can see there's this has to be it, right? There's no other. One is it. There's no nothing. This thing doesn't curve around like that, right? So what we are trying to do is this. This curve graph potentially looks like this. And this is line that y is equal to one. And then, uh, whatever, that is one, right? This is one, three. And then how do we know these things don't exist is the question, right? They don't. Do you know why they don't exist? If I flip that around, it's gonna look like this, right? And it fails the vertical line test, so it's not a function. So people would not write a test question like that. Ah, how's that? Right, so remember in this case, I had to put that restriction down just to make sure there's no confusion. So if there are multiple of them, then there has to be a restriction to make sure that to communicate there's no ambiguity in the problem. So problem itself will take care of you. If there's no other restriction, then you know that is the one and only point. Get it? Okay, that was great now, right? So we got away with one. So this is it. Alrighty, so x is equal to 1. 
is the only point. This becomes one and this becomes one. So far so good. After that is easy. This is the difficult part. After that, derivative itself is very easy. 3x squared plus 1, isn't it? And then what do we evaluate this at? 1. You get it? And you get 4. See what that tells you is slope right there is 4. You get it? And of course, slope over here, g inverse prime of 3, that needs to be 1 fourth. So that tells you this slope right here. Is a reciprocal. You get it? Is it crystal clear? Yes. Yeah, for some unfortunate reason, our book neglects this part, but if the AP puts it on the test all the time, I'll probably put it on the test. Did I get your attention now? I'll probably put it on your test this Friday. So yeah, you might want to pay it. This thing shows up on AP all the time. It's not a hard problem. It's just like, do you understand what inverses and derivatives, how they are related? Having said that, then we are ready for derivative of inverse trig function. This is somewhat related topic. So suppose y is equal to y. y is equal to, we want to find the derivative of that thing. Ew, how are you gonna, ew, any idea? And then you notice that this is not the derivative at certain point, then we can actually use the same tactic that we did here. But it's, no, it's just general derivative in terms of x, like ew, you, 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 you. How are you going to do that? Well, here's a very, very important skill. How now? Warning. Caution. There are a bunch of formulas in your book. If I ever see that formula any at any part of the test, it's automatic zero. OK. You know how I feel about formula. Right? I mean, I want to punish you if you want to use the formula ever. And eventually there will be some negative 10 point rule. Like if you use the formula, it's negative 10. Okay, but for now it's automatic zero. So remember, when, I, when you're reading the textbook, yeah, how many of you really read the math textbook? But if you're reading, skip over that formula. Don't even read it. Because whatever you don't know cannot hurt you. Okay? You're like, don't. This is how I want you. This is the only way I'm going to accept it. It has an inverse relation. How about that? Good? Now we can take a derivative on both sides. I'm going to move this x over just a little bit so I can squeeze in derivative symbol. So what we can, oh no, not like that. So then we can take a derivative with respect to x on both sides like this. You get it? And let's see what happens. So what's the derivative of y? I mean the derivative of sine? Cosine. Cosine y and this side is one and this is the most common mistake. What did I forget? Can you catch my mistake? DUI, DUI. DUI over the S. Do you remember the implicit derivative, right? We have this denominator right here is X. So whenever you see Y, this thing happens, right? Okay, then DY over the X is equal to one over cosine known as secant Y. Eh? You with me so far? Yes. Say yes. 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 Okay. Yes. And then, so this dy over dx is secant. What was y? It's this. You get it? <gasps> Wait a minute. Do you remember this kind of problem from precalculus? Yeah, that's why they've been giving you. How did we do this? 
Draw a triangle. Draw a triangle, right? So it's like right there. So inverse sine, meaning what that really means is that y is the angle right here, isn't it? And then inverse sine has to be x. So do we put x here and do we put one there? Is that how we did it? Yeah. Yeah, that's how we did it. See, this is the key line. Sine y is equal to x, so sine of y is, you know what I'm saying? And then, of course, Pythagorean theorem tells you this side is 1 minus x squared, and I don't have to show you how to find it, right? Okay, so this thing now becomes, I'm going to write it underneath, Secant of that thingy, secant is this side over that side. So one over square root of one minus x squared. Huh, how about that? Oh, that's why they made you do this that many times. Oh, it's everything was about calculus now, wasn't it? You so with me? So when it asks us to find the derivative, uh-huh. If like so inverse sine is part of the function, then we have to derive it like this every time. Yes. Okay. okay. Now you don't really have to write this thingy because sine y, then you can go with it. I just wrote this to remind you of, but from here you can go here directly. Okay. Now. Wait, sorry, uh, from where to where? You can go from here to here. Okay, thank you. Okay, because the other line is just like we all know what y is. Y has been written up there, right? Okay, well then, I have a question. That's nice and swell, right? So what, what is the question now? Like you're a little worried. Can x be negative? Oh, domain and range. Let's review domain and range of this thing. Okay, what what does the graph of inverse sine look like? It looks like this, doesn't it? So this is one, and this is negative one, and this is pi over two, and this is negative pi over two, correct? Then it certainly can be negative, right? X, C, X can be negative. And this is unfortunate that you idiot pre-calc book only put the positive section. Right. But it could be negative. We have to worry about it. Actually, your current idiot book only throws the triangle in the first quadrant. But now this is calculus BC. Right? Where is the honor? So if X becomes negative, where is that triangle? It's right here, you get it? And let's not put negative x, that x is a negative value. You get it? This x is positive here and this x, this x is negative. And look from, there's a pi over two and this is negative pi over two. From negative pi over two to positive pi over two. You see how it describes the domain and range? Ah, does that change our answer? No, it does not, because that side is still positive square root one minus x squared. So we still use, even if it's negative, it's this over that. Oh, we got away with one, hey? Huh? How about that? Okay, that's nice and swell now, isn't it? Okay, well then, shall we do another one? Shall we do inverse cosine? Ah, no, no, let's not do inverse cosine. Let's do inverse tangent. I will let you figure out inverse cosine. Y is equal to inverse tangent of X. Okay. Let's do that. So what, tangent Y is equal to X. Let's try to remember the restriction. Once you write it like that, I didn't write, ah, I should write it. It's not just that same all of them. So I guess negative pi over two You know, that is implied, right? Whenever we are given the inverse function, it comes with this restriction, okay? So even if the problem doesn't tell you, it's your responsibility to know. And same thing applies here. Say this y is between negative pi over two and pi over two, you get it? It's your responsibility. 
Okay, with that, now they are, these two are exactly the same statement. Then, derivative, you, tell me you know this is secant squared. How about that? Okay, then. So dy over dx is equal to, okay. Over here, it's instead of writing secant y, it's wanting to say that's one of a cosine y. That's okay, that's understandable, right? I'll take it. But let's not say this secant squared. Come on, that's definitely cosine now, isn't it? You should know that one over secant is cosine. Okay, now, so this is cosine square of inverse tangent y. You get it? So let's go to the sketch, right? Okay. So this is one and this is x and this angle right there is y is how you're taught, right? But then of course, can it be negative? Yeah, sure, it can be negative there. You know what I'm saying? And then we'll calculate that hypotenuse. Is it square root of one plus x squared then for both of them? And they're both positive, eh? Oh yeah, no problem, no sweat, right? Okay, so dy over dx is equal to cosine. Cosine is this thingy over that thingy, right? Over this thingy, over this thingy. Ah, oh, it's the same thing, so it doesn't matter. Ah, oh, you see how nice that works out? So this is one over squared, but we are squaring it, so one plus x squared, huh? <sighs> How nice was that, right? One thing that, one observation, this is always positive, right? And this is greatest when x is equal to zero and that value is one. The slope is greatest at the origin, which is one. And as x go, approaches infinity, it flattens out, it becomes zero. Do you see that? Is that true? Our inverse sine function looks like that, right? Yeah, it is true. This happens to be one exactly 45 degrees and it flattens out and it's all, you get it? We could have played that game earlier too. You see, this is always, it's a maximum right here and that's also one and as X approaches one, this thing becomes infinity. See how vertically it stands up and this side too? And it's always positive. How about that? Ah, wait, I see your hand. Yes, Sarah. Um, yes, Mr. Kim. So I'm just wondering about the domain. So since the inverse of sine doesn't have like a domain that extends to infinity, shall we no, still- No, no, it does start? not. Inverse sine actually comes with this restricted domain. It's from negative one to positive one. Right, so in that case, do we still, can we still consider like a derivative of like infinity when it approaches infinity? Like oh yeah, the, the, it's a y value. This is a, the derivative does not have the same range as this. Right, if this function itself has this restriction, but derivative, it can go as you can see, all the way to infinity. Oh, okay. You have to evaluate the derivative, but as you can see, derivative, the lower bound for the derivative is one, right? So it's actually from one to infinity, huh? You really have to evaluate it to know. You cannot assume that they have the same domain and range. Ah, oh, how about that? And that makes sense because the inverse sine function, that's an excellent question, by the way. Inverse trig function, and this is just a regular algebraic function, isn't it? They are like two different beasts. And hopefully from last year, you're wondering why does like these things give you that? Well, this is why now. It's one of those weird things. Because if you take a derivative of trig function, you get trig function, but not with the inverse trig. It's one of those weird things. Okay, any other questions? I'm a little bit pressed against time, and if I don't finish this, then okay, video. Okay, then let's do secant, right? Secant is the nastiest one, so we have to get to secant. Say y is equal to, 
inversely can LX. That means secant y is equal to x with these restrictions. Okay, I'm not gonna really that has a weird, weird domain and range, right? But we should know this is first quadrant and second quadrant. Let's just say it that much. So far so good. Now then what's the derivative of secant? U. You you have to know how to derive this by different quotient. It is secant tangent. My pen. Did my pen die? Nope. And the y over the x. One. Okay. Oh my god, there are two of them. That, that is awful, but no, 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 no. This is x. Okay. Do you see it right there? It's x. Oh, oh, thank God, right? So we only need to figure out tangent. So dy over dx now is equal to, so I'll just put x in the denominator, right? And then let's put cotangent here. You with me? Okay, let's figure this out. So we have this thingy, and then was this it? Was this it or not? We don't have a whole lot of time, so we answer the question. We, those of you who were paying attention at the beginning of the semester, I told you this is not how you do it, right? And I explained the reason as well. What's wrong with this? Because x could be negative, right? It could go all the way to negative infinity, domain of this thing. But if x is negative, you see the problem with that triangle? That messes everything up. Because our y is the first quadrant and second quadrant. Nothing ever exists in third quadrant when it comes to inverse trig functions. So that's not how you do it. And did I tell you the story behind it? The uh, pre calc teachers sitting around in a circle and having meeting about this? Okay, we did. And this is a brief summary of that meeting. Teachers all knew this was not correct. Correct way was this. And this is why. That way, if x becomes negative, you see how it stretches to the other side and this is still one. How nice is that, right? And then your y can be in first quadrant or second quadrant. How's that? And this thing works out just beautifully. However, algebra gets very ugly. So I'm going to do that. I guess I will run. I will tell you the story about that meeting later. And we had to decide what to do about this. OK, so we are calculating this side right there. That is square root of 1 minus 1 over x squared now, isn't it? And that is equal to x squared minus like that, eh? And that is equal to, right? Say yes. No, you're wrong. God, how many? Why <laughs> you... Right? Ah! Square root of x squared is absolute value of x. It's not x, okay? God, how many points do I have to take for you to know this? Okay, now cotangent y. What is cotangent y then? We are ready. Cotangent y is this side over that side, isn't it? You. You want me to flip it over and multiply or just shove it all together into giant, gigantic fraction? Your choice. We don't have a whole lot of time, so decide quick. Just put it there. Okay, as you wish. That's what you got. <laughs> do you change your response back now? Okay, I'll do it the other way too. One over x and divide by this, so flip it over and multiply. 
and then put another one over x. Is it better? OK, so what we have is this. Now, how the heck do we simplify this? Like something that you definitely want to simplify this, right? How you do it? This is how you do it. What? 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 Here's the justification. You get it? So you cancel one. The other way of thinking about it is this is always positive. So this magnitude wise they cancel and you have to make sure they are always positive. Uh, absolute value in some weird way of by putting that x here and do this idiotic way. But no, no, this is the correct way. Okay, don't go with the book. 